2016 Multimedia and Music Miniconf. Um, I'm Jonathan Woody, one of the organisers. Um, Sylvia Pfeiffer helped with this, but unfortunately, for various reasons, wasn't able to attend LCA this year. Before we get into our first talk, I'll just um, outline a couple of things about the day. Um, we've got three sessions, uh, this one, lunch, session two, then afternoon tea, and then a third session um, at the end of the day. Um, we've got three talks in uh, the first two sessions. So the first one, um, in a minute, uh, Bedale will be giving an open approach to whole house audio, um, followed by Sebastian and Hugh's talk. In the second session, um, we've got the Dreambox talk, real-time tuning analysis, and the Auto Kinetic Library talk. And then in the third session, uh, we've got a talk about conference recording, um, and then some programming language demos, lightning talks, and the like. If anybody has lightning talks that they'd like to give, um, please come and see me at some point during the day, and uh, we'll get that set up. The Schedule is as per the Multimedia and Music Miniconf website. Uh, that hasn't changed now for quite a, for about a week. Um, so if you need to check what is on when, go to the website and have a look at the schedule there and uh, it is as per that. Um, we're also going to have a hands-on hardware demonstration. Um, Michael's giving a talk uh, in the main conference about his uh, museum uh, exhibit system and hopefully over lunchtime he will set that up over there on that table um, so that during the course of the afternoon people can actually have a hands-on play with that um, hardware because that's something that he can't obviously do very easily as part of a main conference presentation so it's sort of a bit of a teaser for, the, uh, for his talk later in the week. Um, and then finally we've got um, a few uh, talks during the uh, main conference that are related to multimedia. Um, I'll go through these again a bit later in the day. Uh, there's four of them, two Wednesday, one Thursday, and one on Friday. And I'd like to hand over to B. Dale, uh, who will uh, give us his talk for the first session today uh, on his whole of house audio system. That on. Is, that, is that working okay? You're okay? Great. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming by. Um, I'm really excited to be at another LCA. Um, for those of you who weren't paying attention this morning, I got to stand up starting with uh, 2002 in Brisbane, and I've been at every LCA since. Um, I had the realization on the plane down here that I believe this is the first year I've ever attended LCA where I'm not giving a talk in the main conference. So a little bit of a... In, in, no slight to me, I didn't submit any talk proposals this year, so <laughs> <laughs> I've been kind of busy. Um, your they're up here. Of course they're not up there. Uh, yeah, well, you know, it's the, you, you get things working and then you plug and unplug and all that. Let's just do this real quickly. Hey, it's nice when things work. Okay. <clears throat> You'd think I've done this once or twice before. Um, okay, so what I want to do this morning, I, when I saw the, the uh, call come around for sort of, does anybody else have anything they want to talk about in this mini-conf, uh, it just occurred to me that, oh, you know, uh, maybe the things we'd been playing around with uh, doing whole house audio in the new house might be interesting. So I sent a note to Jonathan and Sylvia and said, well, this isn't exactly sort of multimedia-ish, at least I'm not sure it's really thematically connected with the Minicon all that well, because this is more about a little open hardware project and applying bits of already existing open source to build something uh, in a sort of what I did and, and how we use it kind of way. Uh, but they were really enthusiastic, so hopefully uh, you'll find this entertaining too. So uh, what's this all about? Well, those of you who are in Perth uh, heard me talk about um, this little event, um, 2013 June, a Black Forest fire in Colorado took our house away. Uh, the good news is within a couple of years, um, really gorgeous, nice new house. We've been settling into that for 16 and a half, almost 17 months now. <coughs> and uh, we're really, really quite happy. Um, but along the way to designing and building a new sort of high-end full custom house, there are an awful lot of things that you think about and uh, opportunities 
opportunities that are offered to you. And one of them was that um, our builder proposed including a whole house audio distribution system in the new house. And we had a chance to visit some uh, other people that had built houses with this guy. And uh, one of them, when we went to visit, had Pandora streaming through uh, the house and sort of showing up in all the rooms and nice little background music while we were chatting with them. And we went, oh, yeah, OK. That whole house audio thing's kind of cool. In the past, you know, I had had a little tablet sitting on a dock next to my desk in my office that you know, I could stream music on. And with its crappy little speakers, it kept me entertained. But uh, this notion of, you know, as long as we're building this house, let's just pre-wire it and do something fun seemed good. Now, to be clear, a lot of folks nowadays tackle this problem using uh, things that sort of use Wi-Fi or wired networking to distribute bits. Um, things like the Sonos products are very popular with some people. And I've seen a number of uh, open source, open hardware projects that are about recreating that kind of experience. The idea that you have a media server somewhere in the house and you're streaming bits to Raspberry Pi boards or something in different places. Um, this is sort of taking the other architectural approach because the original plan was to put speakers you know, mounted into the ceiling in various rooms. And with the way our house is laid out, we ended up with nine different zones to find. <clears throat> and you know, honestly, I might really have rather had 11. But at the time, the proposal was there were these sort of cool uh, one new rack mount uh, pro proprietary audio server product uh, that knew how to drive three zones each and could be ganged together and sort of you know, integrate with each other. And they, the feature set was pretty cool. They were network attached. You could do Spotify and Pandora. It had various protocols for uh, attaching to uh, local servers full of media files if you wanted to you know, play tunes off of ripped CDs or whatever. Um, and it came with you know, web, Android, and iOS control clients. But um, <coughs> as you'll see, there are a couple of issues with this plan, and we ended up not really going that way. But uh, sort of the key idea here was speakers and uh, wires that were hardwired back to a central mechanical closet. And then the conceptual model that we were after was something sort of like this, you know, some set of audio sources, something like a big crossbar switch in the sky that you could control so that you kind of pick which zones were attached to which source at any given time, um, a bunch of amplifiers, one per zone, driving stereo speaker sets installed in the various rooms. And this is, you know, what we were thinking and what we were trying to shoot for. <coughs> but as I've said, you know, this is the original plan and so forth. So um, obviously there was a fly in the ointment somewhere. Anyone want to take a wild guess as to what the problem was? OK, you said proprietary. You said not open source project. I would have actually been totally OK with buying a proprietary solution for this because it's just, it's just a piece of infrastructure, right? It's an appliance. But I can't live with that. <coughs> oh. <laughs> I'm very carefully going to avoid mentioning who the manufacturer was for two reasons. One, uh, my due diligence stopped at the point where I couldn't figure out any more without actually like picking up a phone and calling their headquarters. Um, and secondly, under the terms of the GPL, since I never actually bought anything from them, therefore they did not distribute any binary software to me, they owe me nothing in the way of source code. And so in, for me, <coughs> I never experienced a GPL violation, but when a home builder gives you uh, contact with a local audio video installer guy and he sends you the proposal of what they want to install and being a geek you take all the model number and so forth information and go look him up on the web to see what those all look like and whether they seem like they'd be fun or not and you hit this particular manufacturer's website and you can't find a whole lot of information about uh, the firmware, there's no obvious way to download firmware updates, certainly no obvious offers of source code. You go into the support section, you see some screenshots, and the terminology of the prompts on the administrative interface are very clearly Linux kernel specific configuration questions. <clears throat> and there's no mention of you know, any open source GPL license stuff in the product at all. And they want to charge you something like $4,000 per server. <clears throat> Your response is, you know, I might just not do that. <clears throat> so, revised plan. 
Uh, let the builder go ahead and install the speakers and the hard volume controls in the wall in each room and so forth. That had already been spec'd out. They were, at the point I was doing this analysis, basically like this close to being ready to install all that stuff and you know, finish up all the wiring of the wall so that they get, get started with the interior uh, wall finishes and all that sort of thing. Um, so this was sort of an easy thing to just say, yep, okay, we'll pay for the installation of the speakers and the wiring, just please don't order <coughs> and install those hideous servers. Um, and, you know, I investigated a lot of other existing bits of audio kit. Uh, it turns out, for example, that you can buy really nice pro-quality audio matrix switchers that work with line level, you know, balanced audio. They're made for use in recording studios and things like that. The problem is they're priced as if they were made for use in recording studios. Um, a nice, in order to handle nine zones, you end up with, I think end up looking at something like a 10 by 10 crossbar and uh, in a nice little one new rack mount box. And in my head, I immediately understood sort of what the schematic would have to look like for that. Um, they wanted multiple thousands of dollars. And it's like, okay, it would be in a nicely screen printed box, you know, that goes in a rack and looks good, but wow, that's a lot of money. And, you know, what am I going to drive this with? Well, yeah, you know, um, there are USB attached, you know, controllable uh, FM receivers. We have this pile of, one of the things that did survive the fire was a little server that had the file system with all of the ripped audio CDs and ripped DVDs. And, yeah, there are like 400 plus movies and Lord knows how many things. Now, unfortunately, the original media objects are, you know, molecules again after rapid oxidation. But, um, <laughs> But we still have most of the bits. And so, um, you know, we had content, right? And by the time we uh, got to building the system, uh, I had gotten really uh, comfortable using Pandora in various ways, though I've become less enthusiastic about them over time. And the rest of the family seemed to have discovered Spotify and be all excited about you know, their access, the rather large library of uh, content. Um, so, you know, we started thinking about these things, but <coughs> after a while, what I realized was this is all like crazy complicated. I didn't need all of this complexity. Um, but I ought to be able to do this if I were to just, you know, I, I kept thinking, gee, if there were just like a nice USB to stereo audio thing, and it turns out if you go look on Amazon or elsewhere, there are people who make those. And the problem is all the ones other people make, you know, have weird issues. Like they want to use a wall wart AC adapter to provide power, and now you've got derpy little barrel connectors all over the place. and now, how are you going to mount these little aluminum encased things on the wall? And I don't know, the more I thought about it, uh, the more I realized that paying more for somebody else to have built a product, which I then sort of had to figure out how to mash together into the way I wanted to use it, wasn't going to make me totally happy. Um, and so I ended up designing this, and I'll pass this around shortly. Um, this is a cute little piece of hardware, and I'll talk a bunch more about it in a couple of minutes. Um, but it turns out nine of these boards, um, a little low power Linux server, uh, a USB hub, uh, and the Moppity software stack um, is providing surprisingly cool service in this application. So here's what the actual sort of system diagram looks for like these days. Um, there's the file server. It's actually, <coughs> I have actually replaced the file server we saved from the fire with a newer server, but all the bits got moved across. Um, I have a little Intel MinoBoard Max, and I'll talk about why the MinoBoard Max. Um, yeah, actually, it's just because I had one. Um, and then, <laughs> honestly, one of the most problematic pieces of hardware in this entire system has been um, the powered USB hub. Um, yes, you can buy them for less than $8 US on Amazon, and you get, you know, so much less than what you pay for. <laughs> <laughs> and then the project name for this board is USB Class D, because it's USB Audio Class D Amplifier. And as you can see, there are nine of those. Uh, one for each of the zones, and they each drive speakers in the different rooms. So what's on this board? Well, let me go ahead and get this started around so you can look at it. Um, one thing I'll show you before I send it around, um, the connectors I chose, the mating connectors are actually kind of cool, and you can feel free to pull them out and take a look if you want. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen these. Um, they're pretty common, and yet a lot of folks hacking around with open hardware don't ever seem to discover them. Um, this is a connector part that goes on the board, another part that obviously plugs and unplugs with a pretty good snapping factor. The exciting part is that this actually has screws in it, so you can put individually stripped wires in and crank down on them. So if you're doing something like wiring things up in a home uh, wiring closet 
where you've got you know just wires coming from all the different rooms, not having to like solder up all the connectors or go crazy with a crimp tool, just being able to strip them, have your son stuff them all in and screw them down <coughs> is pretty handy. So Jonathan, you want to take a look at that? Feel free to pass it around. Uh, that's a working board. You'll see scribbled on the back, it says 15 watts per channel. It turns out the um, Class D amplifier chip I'm using from TI, the 3118, there's also a uh, 3130, which is 15 watts per channel, and the 3116, which is 50 watts per channel. Um, the 15 watt per channel board, they claim, doesn't require any extra heat sinking with an appropriate layout on a two layer circuit board the, uh, with like just ground plane stuff on the top surface. <coughs> the uh, 30 watt per channel board, in theory, doesn't require any additional heat sinking if you're on a board where you can put lots of copper on both layers. And unfortunately, the 50 watt per channel one actually has a thermal pad on the top of the chip and you have to bond it to some kind of a heat sink, otherwise it will melt. So <coughs> um, even though class D amps are pretty efficient, you'll see when it goes around, the, the class D amp part is the one that's sort of in the center of the board between the large electrolytic caps that are standing up. Um, the board layout that I chose <coughs> uh, sort of precludes putting a top mounted heat sink on and honestly, 30 watts per channel for background audio in ceiling mounted speakers is way more than adequate. Uh, those parts are really cheap too, by the way. So uh, I think the total materials cost on that board to me is somewhere in the $35 range, something like that in small quantities, uh, which makes it price equivalent-ish to what you can buy a cheap sort of headphone amp, class D <laughs> amplifier from, from somewhere like Amazon, but um, a whole lot better suited for my needs. The um, part that actually makes audio is the PCM2705. This is another TI chip. It was actually originally Burr Brown, who were acquired by Texas Instruments. Um, that's actually a pretty decent quality audio interface. <coughs> um, there are variants of it, the 2704 through 2707, and they differ primarily on what you do with the audio once you've generated it. Um, the even numbered versions, for example, are generally designed to drive uh, a, a uh, I forget what the name of the bus is, it's a different audio digital bus into something like a, yeah, one of those things. I, I don't remember, I'd have to look at the data sheet. Um, they were not the parts I wanted <coughs> because they were generally designed for people who then want to put some kind of a digital signal processing chain downstream of the audio recreation. Um, but the 2705 and 2707 parts are just basically stereo DACs. <coughs> and the audio quality is just fine. Uh, for this kind of application, you know, people, people have given me a hard time about using a class D audio amplifier. They're like, dude, that's not hi-fi. I mean, this is your house, don't you care? And the answer is, eight inch speakers mounted in the drywall ceilings of the house? Are you kidding? Um, <coughs> they sound great. And in fact, the fam over here is nodding, smiling and all that. They're actually really happy with the results. And I happen to be running the amps on 24 volts DC. They can handle anything from about seven or eight volts to 25. And um, when you go to buy cheap Chinese switchers, <coughs> you have your choice. I happen to pick a 24 volt supply. It's sort of at the good end of the efficiency range. And th there's, you'll, I'll show you the schematic in a second, but the, the sort of interesting thing in here is that the um, audio DAC has the ability to output the suspend signal, which allows the amplifier part to be put in a low power standby mode when you're not running that zone. And that's pretty cool because it means it really doesn't consume very much power except when you're actually making audio once you get it doing the right things. So this is the first half of the schematic. This is the, the, um, the USB DAC chip. Um, <coughs> as I am want to do, it has like a few extra parts in there to do filtering on the USB lines and stuff. Um, basically, you know, Everywhere I could put EMI or RFI filtering or that sort of thing I did. Um, and this is the class D uh, stereo amp part. It's not complicated, except that, you know, it looks complicated over here on the right, but if you stare at it for a second, it's just some inductors and caps and a few resistors implementing snubber networks to the, the those 10 micro Henry uh, series inductors are the big squarish looking ceramic bits on the board. Um, they are carrying, you know, the full audio current and therefore they have to be reasonably chunky power handling inductors. Um, but the rest of this is all about um, making sure that um, sources of RF interference in the house, you know, wireless remote controls and all that sort of thing don't somehow get back into the audio system and 
you're actually listening to the audio you want to. Uh, this worked out great. These things are dead silent uh, when they're not being used. For those who haven't seen the board yet, that's what it looks like. Um, I designed these originally with the notion that if I needed to heat sink them seriously, I might mount them each to a piece of aluminum slab in the sort of quarter inch or six millimeter thickish range and sort of stand a bunch of those vertically, you know, mounted against some sort of a big heat sink. <coughs> but I've discovered that in fact they really don't make that much heat. And so as you'll see in a sec when I show you a photo of it, I've actually installed nine of these side by side on a single sort of aluminum substrate, mostly just to have a way to mount them to the wall. It turns out um, if you screw up the suspend line thing a little bit and you actually don't have the amps powering down, that aluminum gets warm. Uh, my son says, feels like I might burn myself, Dad, but <coughs> I got serious and put my finger on it and did not burn myself, so it wasn't quite that hot. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, scientific. Uh, when I was a kid, <coughs> Well, when I was a kid, you know, living in the U.S., we mostly have 110, 120 volt AC running around, but the houses are actually wired 220 in. We just don't tend to use it for most appliances. But big things like, you know, uh, stoves and le electric cooking appliances and uh, electric dryers and things like that and welding gear uh, tend to use 240. And uh, Grandpa's test used to be, you know, <coughs> and he could tell you very quickly if it was, you know, 110 or 220. But. <coughs> Oh, and, and, and by the way, the first thing Grandpa said is, two fingers on one hand, not like this. <laughs> as long as I'm telling funny stories about Grandpa, he moved into the house after my grandma passed away the year I was a freshman in, in college and um, brought his welding gear and needed a 220 outlet <coughs> in the garage to power that. And um, the main distribution panel was in the basement between the washing machine and the utility sink. And, my mother came down with a load of laundry one day and I was standing there on two two by four pieces of wood on the floor with one hand very carefully in my pocket and the other in the panel putting the nuts on the live, you know, 240 volt rails to connect up the wiring to the new outlet in the garage since we didn't have space for another breaker. We were just putting a separate breaker box downstream of the bus rails. She came and kind of took one look at me, kind of looked down at what I was standing on, saw what I was doing, put the laundry down quietly and backed away. <laughs> So this isn't quite that scary. This is actually the wall, one wall of the mechanical room in the new house. And the audio stuff is up there in the upper left corner. I'll zoom in and show you a little bit more. Um, the funny part is that white box in the center was supposed to be like the junction box for where all the wiring and stuff came in. I don't know what these guys were thinking. That box, if we actually did all the connections in there, would have needed to be about six times as big. <coughs> but whatever. Um, and yeah, there's an AC sub panel in that room. It's a sub panel, not the main panel. The little outlet strip down there, sort of in the bottom right, is actually uh, being fed off of an uninterruptible power supply. So all the networking gear, all the whole house audio stuff, the servers in that room are all running on uninterrupted power, which is kind of important since we live out in the woods. And um, even though our electric co-op is really great, um, we do get outages from time to time. So here's a couple of close-up shots. The thing on the left is a 10-port USB hub, uh, powered USB hub. And from Amazon, I literally paid $6.80 a piece delivered for those hubs. Uh, the first one, it turns out that, you know, uh, eight of the outputs actually worked. <coughs> <laughs> the other thing you discover about these really cheaply manufactured USB hubs is they're totally randomly wired in terms of which connector on the front is going to enumerate in which order. I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes, but um, <clears throat> yeah, you know. Uh, the nice thing is I found that um, the failure rate on these isn't that bad, and if you buy three or four of the same model at the same time, <laughs> you can find one on which all the ports seem to work reliably. So, <clears throat> and at that price point, you know, why would I go spend more money? It's uh, that literally, you know, even, even with the, uh, so, so I actually have a, a working spare and uh, then the dead one. So my total investment there is like less than $20 in um, an afternoon, right? Um, and then there's the aluminum slab. <coughs> you can sort of see at the top of the photo there are a couple of screws where holes in that are allowing it to be screwed into the wall. Um, and then each of these boards has on the left side uh, DC power going in and USB, and on the right side stereo audio output, and that's literally all there really is there. The other two important components in this are the DC power supply 
And um, yes, there is a trick involved in getting that many spade lugs to all sort of fit on those Chinese-made screws without stripping the screws. Um, and that's just the little minnow board max. And seriously, the minnow board max, why did I pick that? This could have been any little embedded server. In fact, it could have been another PC chassis or something. There's nothing magic about this. It's just a little machine running Linux uh, with a USB output and a network connection. Um, I like the idea of nailing down a particular piece of hardware for this application, though. And part of that, honestly, has to do with issues like managing USB enumeration, knowing exactly what hardware is attached at any given time, <coughs> because then things are sort of deterministic and, and it works a little better. Um, but the reason I picked this instead of a little embedded ARM board or something, there are really two, two things I thought about there. One is, I knew that we were going to want to have support for Spotify and or Pandora. Those are both commercial services. It turns out that there's, um, what's the name of it? Pythos <coughs> is a Python client for talking to Pandora. It works really well. Seems to be completely open source. Does not appear to have any dependencies on binary libraries or anything like that. So that protocol seems to be adequately reverse engineered that there's a decent open source client for it. Uh, Spotify, on the other hand, all of the things that interact with Spotify link against some binary library they provide. Um, not totally thrilled about that. I'd be a whole lot happier if <clears throat> that didn't have to be the case. But honestly, uh, familial harmony around you know being able to listen to their tunes uh, trumps absolute open source philosophical adherence on some days. Um, and then I'll mention later, the only problem with <clears throat> buying things like cheap Chinese made switching power supplies is that it would have been nice if they'd spent another nickel on the fan. <laughs> so. The audio server, like I said, it's a small embedded Linux server board. It's running a minium, minimal installation of, shockingly, Debian, uh, running off the micro SD card. And when I say minimal, I mean really pretty minimal. Um, I take this philosophy that's sort of, you know, the earliest I can ex escape the distro installation process, uh, the better. And so it's got a, an SSH daemon and sort of the dependency chain required to run Mopity and not a whole lot else. Uh, it does have NFS auto mount access to the media tree on the file server. Um, that works surprisingly well. Uh, NFS has been around a long time. Fortunately, the auto mount, auto FS stuff <coughs> uh, seems to just kind of work. And then, as I mentioned a couple times, we're running Mopity uh, audio server software. Now, uh, Mopity is kind of interesting. I think it was originally written with the intention of being sort of part of your desktop environment and something that you could sort of <coughs> control in various ways to sort of generate a single audio stream that you could listen to. <coughs> um, and we're abusing it a bit in the sense that um, there are a few bits and pieces in the configuration that make it possible to run sort of a single instance on a, a machine and have lots of people interact with it. But this is clearly outside of its primary area of focus. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. <coughs> the important features to me were, though, that it supports this MPD protocol. Um, which is uh, uh, something lots of folks have written clients for interacting with. So it's the music player daemon uh, protocol. And there's a lot of cool little programs out there that can talk to it. It also has sort of a, a web interface plug-in uh, extension thing that we've used a little bit. Um, I am using the packages for Debian from the Mopity site and not the stuff that's actually in the Debian archive. Um, that's largely because the Spotify uh, plugin is not packaged for Debian because it has a dependency on the non-free binary blob that comes from the Spotify folks. It also turns out this makes it really easy to keep all of those pieces in sync because the upstream developers are rebuilding every time they update stuff. It doesn't really matter. That's just what we're using. And then I do have the Spotify sound and SoundCloud plugins. And as I mentioned, it has sort of a pluggable infrastructure for web clients. And we've played with a couple of those. Uh, honestly, they're all a little clunky, but they do work. So issues I ran into, I've already mentioned the USB enumeration thing. The problem is those boards that I built, <coughs> um, I could have made the board more complicated by adding uh, a memory device that I could program when I manufactured them so they'd all have separate serial numbers or something like that. But the way they come up right now, all the USB tuples are identical. They are indistinguishable from each other except by where they're plugged in in the hierarchy of USB hubs. Um, the good news is, uh, with a fixed hardware configuration, uh, USB um, enumeration in Linux is deterministic. So we can generate a map that says, yeah, OK, the thing that's plugged into the fourth hole in the USB hub is the one driving such and such room. And that's all we really need. And so that's working out just fine. 
Now, if there's ever some change in the Linux kernel that causes the USB enumeration order to change, yeah, I'm screwed. I'll have to spend a you know a whole 15 minutes mapping it out again. But um, <coughs> it helps to have you know a sun that you can send running around the house to sort of tell you which zone is making audio at a given time. We started out literally with the wiring you know on a battery, sort of you know clicking the speakers in the different rooms. Once we got things working at all. Uh, I can now sort of sit there with a laptop in <coughs> a throne-like chair and sort of holler and say, okay, which room is that? Um, but fortunately, once you've done that once, it hasn't really changed. Um, and then I did blacklist the internal audio interface on the Minoboard Max. If I had wanted to, I could have used that as another output, but since I'm not using it, just having it not clutter up the list of ALSA devices was kind of handy, and that's how you do that. It's really trivial. Then, I mentioned that suspend line. So, <coughs> I didn't understand for a while that the suspend output from the USB audio chip is not actually based on whether it's seen audio packets recently or not. It is a direct reflection of whether the <coughs> USB interface is in the suspend state or not. If you've played around with um, power management stuff on Linux at all, you've seen that uh, Linux does not tend to enable auto suspend on USB devices generically. I gather there's enough crappy mice and keyboards and stuff out there that don't handle suspend well, uh, that that's just off by default. Um, which means that <coughs> for a while, as I said, you know, things are running hot and it turns out the unused boards were, you know, the class D amplifiers were sitting there soaking power even when there was no audio going through them. And it really does turn out that the solution for this was almost as simple <coughs> as uh, configuring the kernel to understand that boards that came up with that vendor and product ID on USB were okay to do auto suspend on. That solved most of the problem. The other thing that you discover pretty quickly is in Moppity, if you just pause an audio stream, that's not sufficient. You actually have to stop the audio stream or it doesn't actually resuspend the interface. So stupid little things you learn in the process of using this, but sort of interesting nonetheless. And then I mentioned that for our application, there are some interesting limitations in Moppity. The, the biggest one really is that the Moppity server only understands a single audio stream. <coughs> it was really intended to be sort of a personal media serving thing. And it just doesn't have the concept of multiple parallel streams of audio. And there's also sort of no mechanism as a consequence of that for sort of map th that crossbar switch thing I had in my conceptual model of how do you map from some source to a set of outputs. Um, there are technical mechanisms available for that in also in Pulse Audio, <coughs> in Jack, you know, depending on what you wanted to aggregate together at the back end, there are lots of different ways to map sort of one source to a set <coughs> of, uh, you know, one, one source to a set of sinks, but um, Mopedia doesn't crack that there's new UI for uh, configuring or controlling something like that. And then from a sort of really stupid but important in a family setting standpoint, uh, the Spotify client for the Mopedia server expects the Spotify account credentials to be hard coded in a config file. And in fact, you have to have like a real paid <coughs> Spotify subscription. All of these uh, remote client things that are enabled by Spotify don't work if you just have the free access Spotify account. Um, so, you know, the workaround is kind of clunky, but it really does work pretty well. I'm running nine Moppity instances on that little minnow board. And they are each listening on different MPD and web UI sockets, just a sequence of nine sockets in, in each space. Um, the config file's been hacked a little bit so that the metadata that's generated about that big pile of locally ripped audio CDs and other audio recordings we have, you know, we run the, the metadata updater once, it updates the file that all those configs are pointing to. <coughs> um, and we've just sort of done a, a, a mapping that says, well, in my son's bedroom, it's likely that it should be his Spotify credentials that are in that server. And in my office, um, I probably want mine. And in my wife's design studio, it should probably be hers. That leaves open the question of, well, what do you do in the living room? <coughs> um, and the answer is, well, you know, mom wins that one. And <coughs> yeah, so um, then the, the other sort of essential piece for our usage model is on all of our phones and other Android-y things, um, there's a client called Moppity Mobile. It works brilliantly. 
And it has the ability to be configured to know how to talk to different <coughs> instances of Mopity. So we've just configured it so when you first launch it, you sort of pick which of the zone servers you want to talk to. Um, and after that, you know, it's all sort of tied to the particular zone or room that you're sitting in. It seems to work okay. And then for visitors to the house and other casual users, <coughs> if you just hit the default sort of web server on the audio server, it has a landing page that will connect you to the cor correct web client for talking to that particular zone. So it turns out that in sort of a not really what I want long term, but okay for now kind of way, this is working pretty well. Next steps. I mentioned the cheap Chinese power supply. Um, <coughs> I, I've bought a couple of replacement fans. I just haven't made time yet to disassemble the power supply and put one in. Um, the scary part, um, a good real ball bearing fan costs about what the power supply costs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if it drops the acoustics in the mech room, which happens to be across the hall from my office, um, <clears throat> it'd be worth it. And then the second thing is it occurred to me after a while that listening to that fan <laughs> spending 24 hours a day, seven days a week when we're not using the audio server all the time is pretty stupid. Uh, there's a cute little library that somebody wrote <coughs> that provides a Python UI for wiggling GPIO bits on the Minnow board Mac, so it should be really trivial for me to hack in, a, you know, power the power supply down when none of the zones are making audio thing. Uh, so again, I just need some round to it and we'll get those done. The one other issue that people have asked me about, and I want to mention and acknowledge and then sort of explain to you why I just don't care, <coughs> is clock skew between the zones. So I think you all understand that the way computer audio output works is you're feeding a stream of numbers to a digital analog converter, which is generating either a voltage or a current proportional to those numbers. And the rate at which those conversions happen is determined by an oscillator somewhere, a clock. On the little audio boards I just passed around, there's a crystal on that board which determines the clock rate <coughs> of the DAC and the USB interface speed and all of that. And it turns out that having one of those per zone board allows those boards to be completely independent uh, modules. It's really handy, for example, to be able to just plug one into my laptop, <coughs> plug a couple of speakers into it and hack around on my you know, desk playing with stuff and figuring it out. The problem, of course, is that if you try to feed the same audio source into multiple of those in parallel, those oscillator clocks may not be exactly the same. So over time, <clears throat> there's going to be a little bit of a shift in how fast those bits are being spit out. Well, the first question I got when people heard I was working on this is, how are you synchronizing the audio between the different rooms so they don't sound out of phase? And I laughed. I said, they're in different rooms. <clears throat> no matter where you stand in the house, there are acoustic, you know, physics acoustics delays that mean that unless I, you know, do the whole geolocation thing and figure out exactly where I am to phase adjust, it's gonna. <laughs> yes, okay, that would be a totally appropriate talk for LCA. <laughs> Get to work on that, son. <clears throat> Get to work on that. But, yeah, yeah. So years ago, back in the excitement of Linux on the IPAC era, <coughs> um, I got a chance to visit with the, I got a chance to visit with some friends in the Hewlett Packard Cambridge Research Labs in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and they were at that time doing subroom geolocation stuff, and it was pretty impressive. But I kept kind of going, yeah, you know, I could just turn the light switch on and off too. So <coughs> I have to admit, I'm a little, a little weird about some of this, but. So honestly, when I thought about it, it's like the acoustics of the situation mean that I don't actually care acoustically about trying to synchronize these things that closely. Now, obviously, if you're trying to build you know, a sound reinforcing wall of sound or something and wanted separate amp modules driving a bunch of speakers, you would either decide to build an entirely different topology board where you'd have one conversion to analog and then distribute the analog, and then you just have, just have to deal with analog prop delays, or you'd actually build a board that had, you know, nine of these circuits and a single oscillator. <coughs> but um, it turns out I don't care acoustically. So the only thing that's left is if you want to drive multiple zones in parallel, do you care about the fact that every once in a while there's going to be some potentially discernible 
audio artifact, either a buffer, you know, runs out of bits and goes, you know, zeros for a couple of clock cycles until the other one catches up, or one exhaust and you go to refill it and you end up clipping <coughs> the other buffer. I mean, one way or another, if you're not doing something to synchronize those clocks, you have to either, you know, have a little gap or, or clip something off. Um, honestly, because of the situation where Moppity doesn't sort of provide a mechanism for dealing with the crossbar thing right now, we're not actually trying to drive multiple zones in parallel, so we're just never going to hear this. This has actually been solved in software. You just resample. There are, yeah, you can resample. There's, there's a, you know, Pulse Audio supposedly has a, a module for it. I just haven't tried it. And so my reason for mentioning all of this is if you get excited about what I've done and go to play with it, you will too at some point have one of your astute friends go, how are you dealing with this? <clears throat> and the answer is either, well, BDL says I don't have to care, or <clears throat> um, go investigate one of these other solutions. Uh, quite honestly, I probably just don't care. If slash win, we get around to uh, sort of writing some code to solve the mapping uh, sources to zones things a little more intelligently, <clears throat> um, I might revisit this. Um, but if I do, it'll just be a resampling thing in software, and it should be okay. Um, I'll be honest, I have this tendency when I'm picking parts to put on circuit boards to pick really good parts. Uh, the oscillators I'm using on there are a whole lot better spec than most of the random stuff that you'll buy off Amazon coming out of, you know, wherever the manufacturing happens. So honestly, I suspect this is a pretty small problem in this case anyway, but one way or another <coughs> uh, should be easy enough to deal with. So if you have any other questions, I did put up a relatively skeletal so far, but we'll soon have more content um, web page for the whole house audio project. And if you're interested in this, you know, feel free to come grab me later in the week. I will probably not be around the rest of today because we're going <clears> to <throat> take the family off and do some sightseeing, but I will be around the conference the rest of the week. And I think moppity.org is the moppity site. I was actually on an airplane when I typed that, and I'm not sure. Yeah, John. Wait for the mic. <laughs> Water, um, what a great idea. Uh, just a, a couple of bits of info. Um, Moppity is currently slated for removal from Debian because it still has a GStreamer 0.10 dependency. They have a 1.0 dev branch, apparently, but not quite sure if they'll get that out and stay in Debian or not. So I probably made the right choice to use the Moppity builds instead yeah. of the Debian packages. Yeah. Um, Moppity is also... GStreamer based, which means we have our network clock thing. So a bit of it, dev work in Moppity would give them that clock sync across multiple zones. And oh, that's a good thought. Yeah. So honestly, you know, in terms of sort of to-do list things, if anybody here is interested in hacking on this stuff, the two things that I've thought of that we need to resolve at some point are, one is just kind of stupid. I just am not really sure what the user interface should be. And that is, how could you sort of dynamically set which Spotify account credentials you're using with the Spotify plugin. And the other one is, if I wanted to <coughs> attach more than one sort of audio output, how, what, what's the right thing to do? I mean, there's been some, there have been two or three mailing list discussions at various times over the last couple of years where someone's asked about, could Moppity be extended to support multiple streams? And the answer is, well, yeah, but nobody seems terribly motivated. And I took a quick look at the code. It doesn't look really intractable, but it's also one of those, I want to make sure I understand what I actually want before I start writing too much code, particularly since wife, son, and daughter are all pretty happy with the current config. Um, it's, it's one of those, we're at least 90% of the way to what we want, and I got there with, you know, single digit days of hacking around with config files and figuring out how to make all this stuff work, so. And, you know, a little bit of time building hardware, but I like doing that. By the way, um, the as surface mount assembly and all of those is uh, hand placed and reflowed in a little oven under my bench in the basement. So um, if you haven't played with open hardware stuff before and want to, <coughs> don't be scared of fine pick surface mount parts. They're actually really easy. Have you had any trouble with um Have you had any trouble with accidental full volume spikes going out into face and blasting a room? No. No. Um, actually, so the interesting thing is these chips, both the USB audio DAC and the AMP chip, 
know, there were Burr Brown designs acquired by TI. The Burr Brown guys are just smart as all get out. <coughs> they have an amazing range of protection features, and I very carefully included all of the required passives in the design to enable all of those things. So um, they, they, you know, everything from sort of thermal protection under and over voltage on the supply rails, um, uh, shorts on the output, they're self-protecting. And from an audio artifact thing, the only, I guess, point of irritation at all <coughs> is when I'm testing stuff and all of a sudden I turn on a zone and I don't realize that somebody's actually sitting in that room and I've got the volume all the way up. Um, <coughs> yeah. And, and I guess the one other thing I should mention in that regard is that the only extent to which there's any security on this at all is that it's running on the private network in a house. Um, <clears throat> I haven't tried to secure the server. And yes, if you wanted to wake me up in the middle of the night by you know, blasting some cute jams, I guess you could figure it out. But uh, <laughs> don't do that. <clears throat> um, I assume currently you're just using like the Moppity client to set the volume or otherwise pause the rooms, but did you end up getting the wall controllers installed yes. when you built the house and are they not integrated or are integrated? So what? So, so the wiring that they put in involves four heavy conductors for the stereo audio and a piece of Cat5-ish stuff. And in each room there's a wall-mounted box that right now just literally has a uh, impedance balancing volume control thing and it's just feeding the audio through that. So it is literally a full power Rheostati attenuator, right. So it works. It does work. And the, we're not using the Cat5 control -y stuff at all. <clears throat> um, there were other solutions they were willing to offer us that had less WYSI central control stuff and ended up putting little LCD pad things in the wall. Those all seemed ridiculous to me. Um, but <clears throat> the hard volume controls made sense, A, because when you're building a house, the incremental expense of including those was insignificant in the overall project cost. And I think my wife in particular loves the notion that if the phone rings, she can just grab it and do that and doesn't have to go, you know, unlock the screen to the phone and diddle with all that. Um, right. So basically the way it works is the physical volume control sort of sets what your max volume is and then, yeah, you can control it with the app inside there. So you don't have to stand up to change the volume. But um, if you want it louder than it is, you might. Yeah. And so far, that's actually, it's actually been working out fine. Um, I will admit, um, I tend to drive it almost entirely with the UI. And uh, when my phone's docked on my desk, it doesn't lock. So that kind of works. But who's that? OK, I've got one more question. Yeah, I was going to say, we're who's, about running out of time. Who's, so. got the, who's got the last one? So have you thought about other sources and how you'd integrate them? So if you wanted to have an audio feed from, say, oh, I don't know, your, your shack down to your office or something like that, and then do remote ham radio or something like that? Well, so <clears throat> Moppity has a completely pluggable infrastructure. So if you wanted to add another backend, i.e. give it another potential source of incoming audio, um, that looks actually really straightforward to write a plugin for. Um, in particular, if you wanted to do something like, you know, digitize the bits coming in on the audio interface on the minnow board or something, that'd be really easy. Uh, Moppity also supports streaming. So if, uh, uh, when I get my wife's greenhouse finished sometime this spring, I'm hoping to drop a pie board out there and give her, you know, another audio zone in the greenhouse that's actually, you know, streaming bits over the, the network cable out there. Um, and, and so all of that stuff can work. <coughs> um, in terms of sort of, thinking about using this really differently. The only other application I've really thought about is that right now we use the cordless landline phone stuff in the house to intercom each other. And I could easily see wanting something like a broadcast override. <coughs> you know, can, can I just put audio in every zone in the house and say dinner's ready? <laughs> <laughs> because honestly, that would be less disruptive than hearing you know, one ringy dingy on the phone and having to go pick the phone up. So. Um, I don't know. We'll think through all of that. Anyway, we're, we're out of time. Thank you so much for your time and attention this morning. And as I said, I'll be around the rest of the week if you want to talk about this. And I would like to get the board back. <coughs> Just out of curiosity, quick show of hands. If I were to actually have a bunch of these boards made, does anybody want some? I want the membership on it. Hmm? I want the membership on it. 
You want the... Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Well, we could do that. It's an open hardware design. It's in my Git repo right now. <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> okay, if you uh, join me and thank uh, Bidale, I think you'll agree it was very uh, relevant and very interesting.